Hey, my name is Graham Steele and say, one of my main capacities at present is I am uh, the uh, Open Science Ambassador for Scotland for an organisation called the Open Knowledge International. Uh, that would go back to 2001 uh, due to a, a, a personal bereavement in the family. I started to read the academic papers for the first time in my life. I, I guess I was always uh, interested in science to a certain extent but until uh, 2001 I'd never actually read scientific papers and when you launch into a brand new field it would be quite uh, difficult to actually understand an article, what it's about and for the organisation it was a patient advocacy group uh, that was uh, working with at the time. Uh, if you don't know what a paper is about, contact the author, email them. They might not still be alive, but the point I'm making is that if you, if you don't want to understand, ask, and people will explain to you in the lay terms. So this was to do with uh, neuroscience, so I started to uh, read papers on a much more uh, regular basis, but to my main frustration at that time, uh, having discovered uh, PubMed, which is the main uh, repository for published uh, papers, uh, quite often it's just the abstract, not the full paper, but uh, the main problem I came across was I, I couldn't read the full paper because it was behind a paywall. Uh, open access in terms of uh, STM research and also for humanities and social sciences basically means that uh, rather than information being closed and uh, inaccessible, unless you pay for it, uh, all the information uh, is made uh, openly available, usually through a Creative Commons uh, licence which basically means, uh, as opposed to something that's closed, if something is uh, fully open and open access, you can access it for free, you can reuse it, you can remix it, you can share it without any restrictions legally. It's fantastic. And what's the difference between green and gold open access? In terms of open access, there's various uh, flavours of uh, open access, and the main two that exist are green open access and gold open access. Uh, uh, they both have a synergy, there are advantages, maybe disadvantages of uh, both, but essentially uh, gold open access is, means uh, publishing in a, in a journal that is uh, open. Uh, most uh, open access journals don't charge any fee for submitting a paper to be published if it's accepted. Uh, around about 70% of open access journals are free to submit your research to, and around about 30% charge what's called an article processing charge uh, to get your research accepted for publication. So that's one method of making your research open. Uh, the other option is what's called a green open access, which basically means they're publishing in whatever journal you want to publish in, uh, especially closed journals. And around about 85% 80, of uh, closed traditional subscription-based uh, journals allow you to archive uh, a copy of your accepted paper which basically means you, you can make essentially what is a closed paper <coughs> uh, open by putting it on, a, on a, uh, usually an institutional repository or maybe your personal blog or website. So that's two different ways of making your research open and available so that uh, anybody can do what they want with your research free of charge. And so what are the main advantages of open access, making papers open? Uh, making your papers uh, available to to read to anybody. Uh, if you publish in a subscription journal, especially folk are uh, addicted to what's called the journal impact factor. So for example, if somebody celebrates their career by getting a paper published in Nature, uh, Science or Cell or what we call uh, Glamour Mags, that's good for their tenure under the current system. But if you ask that person, has anybody actually read your paper? I don't know, I don't care. It's published in this uh, journal. But the whole point of, uh, of publishing research is to make it accessible. So I don't uh, follow the philosophy of uh, publishing in, in uh, closed places where nobody can actually read your work, because what's the point of doing a paper if nobody can actually read it? It doesn't make sense to me. So do open access papers, are they more likely to be um, more widely read? Uh, more widely read, and there's uh, a plethora of evidence that confirms that you get more citations for making your work open, either via green or gold. Okay. Um, and so you said you work for Open Foundation? Uh, open Knowledge International. Open Knowledge International. Can you tell us a bit about Open Knowledge International? 
A Open Knowledge International used to be called a Open Knowledge Foundation, then Open Knowledge, and now it's a Open a Knowledge International. It was founded by an academic called a Dr Rufus Pollock around uh, about 11 years ago. And uh, the Open Knowledge are, are all about making uh, information uh, available free of charge, uh, data, open data. They're a big org organisation that are huge into that, uh, making works like uh, Shakespeare open access. And in terms of uh, data, unless it's uh, private, uh, personal, uh, confidential information, apart from that, uh, the philosophy of uh, open knowledge is to make everything open, unless there are good legitimate reasons. Uh, but in terms of uh, information about uh, street maps, timings of public uh, transport, uh, open research, open da data, anything that's, that is, isn't open, we make open, where we can. Can you repeat the question, please? So, uh, are there any issues that open access is still facing um, in terms of sharing open data? Uh, I think the main issue there is that uh, a lot of people don't fully understand the benefits of making data open. Uh, one of the main uh, taglines that uh, I like is uh, one that I've used uh, several times, but uh, publishing research without data is advertising. It's not science. But if you don't publish your data, there's no way that people can actually uh, replicate the work that you've done. But there's a great value in making your uh, research, the outcome of your research, uh, open. But there's also great uh, value in making the data open so that people can actually take the data and do things with it. Because I think uh, the value of data is probably uh, more important than the actual paper binds your research. So making data open has got uh, a lot of uh, significant advantages to not making it open. Yes, indeed they do. My knowledge is generally much uh, better for the United Kingdom, or Great Britain, I should say, uh, than the, the rest of the world. But there's uh, currently seven uh, main funders of, of research, such as the biggest is the Wellcome Trust, who introduced our uh, open access mandate in 2005. But uh, of, the, of the, all the seven, Cancer Research UK, uh, RC UK, etc., etc., they all uh, have uh, ma uh, mandates that have been, been put into place over the last, well, since say 2005, it's getting stronger and stronger. That basically, if, if you get uh, funded to do research, uh, there's no option. You have to make it open. Again, green, gold. Uh, there's also mandates to make uh, data open. And uh, as of uh, 2012, Wellcome Trusts, I'm not too sure if there are others that have followed it, but uh, basically, if you are funded by Wellcome Trusts, and if you fail to comply with making your research open, you'll be punished financially. So open access has teeth. <laughs> okay, um, is there anything else that you would like to say about open access, open data in general? Anything else related to academic publishing? Not off the top of my head. No. Well, one more question then. How do you think academic publishing will change in the next 20 years? It will change to become more open. Uh, as to this, the pace of that change, uh, we don't know. One of the main problems with making progress in that change is that uh, academic publishing uh, globally per year is roughly a sort of $12 billion industry uh, and uh, most of that money goes to traditional publishers such as uh, Elsevier, Wiley, etc. And uh, there's a challenge for them for making their research open because they, they stand to lose uh, billions of dollars or pounds. Uh, but the, the change is moving to open. Uh, they're kind of uh, cheating to a certain extent by uh, maximising uh, maximizing their profits in, in a different way. Making stuff open but still making a lot of money. But uh, this, the current system is, is in my view, uh, morally wrong because uh, us as academics uh, do all of our research. In terms of the, the publication of that research, we do all that work for nothing. We hand our work over to publishers who be, and you hand over your copyrights. So once you finish your research, you're essentially giving it away free of charge. And in order to read your own research, you have to pay to get it back. 
I think that's morally wrong. Thank you very much. One more question. Uh, can you explain the Creative Commons licenses? Uh, Creative Commons licence have been around for roughly 12 years and they're a supplement to traditional copyrights. If you think of copyrights graphically as a C in a circle that, and that stamp, and uh, traditionally, even if I was to have a piece of paper here and write four words or whatever, the second that my paper, my pen leaves that paper, that's copyrighted. I didn't intend to copyright it, but that's traditional copyright, C. The alternative to that in a digital age has got two Cs in a circle. And it's, I'm, not, I'm not wearing one of my Creative Commons shirts today, but say that is uh, Creative Commons, which is a suite of uh, licenses uh, that, are, that are legally binding, they're machine readable, and it gives you roughly five different uh, levels of how open you want to make your research. You can make it public domain, PD, that used to be called CC0, that's the most uh, open license, which basically means they, they, I take my four words and rather than putting a C on it, I put a CC0 and anybody can use my four words. So that's the most open and there's then uh, various other options. It, uh, you, uh, you can share it, but you're not, you're not allowed to make any derivatives. Uh, you can share it, but you can't make uh, commercial use. So for example, as a musician, uh, I've released about 70 songs that I wrote over the years, and they're using different uh, Creative Commons licenses. That, that was about seven years ago, and my knowledge on Creative Commons is much better now than it was back then. But for example, some recordings that I did say were of a, a bands where I didn't actually write the song. So I don't have, I didn't write the song, so therefore I, I'll, I'll make it open, but it's for non-commercial purposes. Because if they found out I was selling their song for nothing, uh, they wouldn't be too pleased. So that's one of the main advantages of Creative Commons is that there's a different tier depending on what suits your needs. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>